I will tell you about the evolution of the perspective on prion-based mechanism of regulation and adaptation, and what is connecting cannibals and the space exploration. That is a challenging leap to do, but where you're looking at right now is a alien uh, island of Papua New Guinea, where Daniel Gaidusek discovered a tribe of uh, uh, cannibals that uh, were suffered from a weird neurological disease that seemed to be transmitted from a person to another. And at that time, no neurological disease of that sort was known. And on this image, you can see kids and you can see women because they were the one that were affected by this disease mostly. They were the one that were eating brains. And that's why they the, the sticks that they hold is because they experience tremors and problems with standing still. Um, and when we're looking at prion, it's probably best to start with the mad cow disease because the term prion became recognizable by the general public because of this disease. But during this talk, I'd like to show you that uh, not all prions are bad and they're very common in nature. So prions attracted the global attention at the end of the last century when the epidemic of prion disease broke out in Great Britain. This epi uh, epidemic was very unusual because it could spread between species and precisely from cows to humans. And so far there were two Nobel Prize awarded for the study on prions one for discovery of the novel way of disseminating diseases. This is what um, Daniel Gaidusek discovered on Papua New Guinea. And the second one for identifying the actual infectious agent uh, as a something that was even smaller than a virus. So the experiment showed that if you deplete the material, infectious material of nucleic acids, it still causes the disease and it baffled uh, scientists for a long time. So what was the infectious particle was a protein, and this protein was eventually named prion protein. So it is, and the name prion protein, prion comes from proteinaceous infectious particle. It's a kind of an acronym. So the scientific community was reluctant to accept the discovery um, of then an infectious agent made only of a protein, none of that was known before. And prions are still the only known infectious agents that have no nucleic acids. Uh, this difference makes prion replication fundamentally different from all biological processes. And the fact that the protein can store biological information seems to even contradict one of the major uh, our understanding of the information transfer in a biological system, uh, so-called central dogma of molecular biology. And this uniqueness of the prion can also promise some amazing discoveries in the fundamentals of how the biology works if we don't need the nucleic acid to transfer biological information. But only now we just begin to understand how important the phenomenon is in a normal biology, not in the disease, but in an everyday life of a cell. So this animation shows a formation of the original prion that causes medical disease. So a prion protein forms a prion. I know it's a little bit of a tongue breaker, but that's what is happening here. So at the beginning, the protein changes its secondary structure, increasing its content of beta sheets. The misfolded protein is then interacting with other copies of the same protein, changing it into the same configuration. And this process repeats indefinitely until all the uh, soluble forms of a protein is depleted. So they're building a higher order structure that grows in one dimension in the form of fiber. And such fiber are shown on the right side of the, of the slide from from the side, right? So it's just like a ladder. So most known prions, they can acquire the form of amyloid. So the amyloid that I mentioned before for Alzheimer, Parkinson, and Huntington disease, and many others, 
those um, are a structural form that the prion can take, but not all amyloids are gonna be prions. Only a subtype of them will behave in this specific way that it allows them to be inherited between cells or between organisms. So importantly, um, the amyloids that are built out of one and the same protein can take slightly different shapes. And you can see this A, B, C, V forms. These are fibers that are made of the same protein, but they do look different. And the shape depends on the final conformation, uh, conforma uh, yeah, conformation of the protein that is building it. And interestingly, different shapes of the fiber have different impact on the infectivity or the ability to cross species barrier. So the conclusion from this is that the biological information is stored in the amyloid fiber shape itself. And the, here is a, a schematics that shows the lifetime of a aggregate. So you start with the monomers, then you build an oligomer, you still have a chance to go back to the monomer, but at some point of when the protofiber is formed, this um, integration of new parts become extremely fast. And in a logarithmic phase, you end up with amyloid that is steady and stable, matured. And because there is no more monomers available, this line is flattens down. So prion relationship with amyloid doesn't really help to repair the image of uh, uh, prions as being bad because they're connected to Alzheimer, uh, to spongiform encephalopathies, prion disease, dementia, Parkinsonism, amyloidotropic lateral sclerosis, Huntington disease, uh, spinocerebral ataxia, and also even type two diabetes or uh, systemic amyloids and many more. So these are all nasty diseases and that's how we discovered amyloids. But are they also present in other organisms and, and more physiological uh, terms? Yes, they are. So for example, amyloid is used to, uh, amyloid form is used into different proteins can build amyloids. So uh, peptide hormones, for example, are stored as amyloids a melanin in our skin is scaffolded uh, as an amyloid. And uh, well, amyloid is also an important part of a structure of silks, or, for example, in silk or in a spider web. Um, a, amyloids are also used by bacteria, excreted proteins excreted by bacteria very often form amyloids. And the most known of them is uh, curly, a protein or CSGA, a curly fiber produced by very commonly used Escherichia coli, a model organism in the many labs. But also Staphylococcus and Bacillus, they have proteins that are excreted and form amyloids. Uh, there are some proteins in humans that if you remove the ability of forming amyloids, they would uh, compromise immune response because they actually boost up immune response by aggregating. There are also two examples of proteins that are uh, evolutionary conserved between Drosophila, mouse, and human, and they all responsible for long-term mammary formation. If you're not able to aggregate in the form of amyloid, this protein, if it's not able, then uh, the long-term memory is not being formed in mouse. So very exciting discovery. Biofilm is an, another part in which amyloids are very useful. So biofilm is a conglomerate of cells bound in extracellular matrix. In the form of biofilm, bacteria are more resistant to stressors and they can attach strongly to different surfaces. This extracellular mat matrix that is composed of uh, many different substrates, but including amyloids, helps them survive and stick to different surfaces. And biofilms, they can cause problems. Uh, so for example, in medicine, they, um, they are present in the mucosal surfaces that here, that's where a lot of infections start. Uh, in the technical systems, 
they called they cause so so called biofouling or biodegradation or biocorrosion. In space, there are documented examples that the biofilm caused troubles on international space station and other spacecrafts. So it mostly leads to the degradation of components of the systems or cause short circuits. Here you have some photos from an actual ISS port with this nasty biofilm forming in a, in a tube. And the more we fly into space, the more we will bring our bacteria and these bacteria are gonna, the longer, the older the systems are and we give more time for bacteria to grow, the more of a problem it is going to be. So there is a big an emphasis at NASA to work and on mitigation of the biofouling on ISS, for example. And we suggested a proposal to how to use anti-amyloid uh, reagents to stop forming amyloids in the biofilm. So for example, here you have a growing colony producing more and more of an extracellular matrix that includes amyloids and the web of those interactions keep bacteria together. But if we are able to use for example, surfaces that would be covered with anti-amyloid compounds, those bacteria should not that easily stick to the surfaces. And on the right side, there is a list of potential uh, uh, reagents that we could use to do that. Now I'll try to bring you uh, to even more uh, maybe Mm, complicated, but like there's a conceptual shift that we have to do because I'm using the, uh, ter the term amyloid and prion, and there is a slight difference that might be hard to grasp, but this graph should help with that. So first of all, the functional amyloid, so what the bacteria are using, for example, to create a biofilm. These are proteins that are synthesized inside of the cell and they don't have really a function inside of the cell until they are get exported and they convert it into amyloid. Then we have this functional amyloid that helps, for example, sticking cells together in the form of biofilm. The prion is also making an amyloid, but the situation is dramatically different. The protein synthesize is a functional protein that has some specific they're very different. There could be very different functions depending on what kind of a protein we're talking about. And we identified thousands of proteins in bacterial genomes that can form amyloids inside of the cell. And so at first, those proteins that are usually, for example, like gene regulators or like translation regulators, they function normally, but then they can come, they, they can experience this conformational change that would make them stick together and form an amyloid fiber that deactivates their first function. More, moreover, this formed amyloid can be passed to another cell and to, during division or when the cell breaks up, this um, these fibers would stay in the environment. They're extremely stable. That is also important to know. This is why they're used in uh, the biofilm because the aggregate in the form of amyloid is extremely resistant to different pHs, temperatures, and just physical sharing. So two, the, a, a major difference between amyloid and prion is that amyloid is gaining and functional amyloid is gaining function when it aggregates a prion is usually losing the like protein that builds a prion is losing its function. And we can predict new prions. So proteins, as we look at the known prion proteins, and the majority of them are right now known in yeast, uh, we can see that there is some uh, common uh, characteristics. So they're usually a low complexity, that those proteins include low complexity regions, those regions of protein that is responsible for aggregation in the form of amyloid slash prion um, are glutamine and asparagine reach. Uh, the depletion, there is a depletion of charge and hydrophobic residues in this protein fragment 
and uh, in long intrins and there are long intrinsically disordered regions that are also important for a phase transition. A, there is a lot of research right now on phase transition of disordered proteins. So uh, the subject of prions strongly overlaps with the uh, phase transition too. So here are some examples of proteins in different organisms that uh, were confirmed, verified experimentally as prions. So in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so the common yeast, uh, there is more than 30 prions already known. Probably Saccharomyces cerevisiae is in general the best studied organism on earth. So it's not, it comes not as a surprise that also the major number of confirmed prions it was found there, but we're slowly expanding to other organisms. Uh, an interesting example that I didn't mention yet is in Arabidopsis, where a lumi-dependent protein is forming a prion, and its ability to form a prion is responsible for flowering, so a very fine, uh, physiological process. And here's how the life cycle of a prion could look like. So as we mentioned, like on the slide with the graph, we start with the native single monomer conformation, conformation of the protein that spontaneously misfolds and then converses other form, other kinds, like other copies of this native uh, protein into a similar beta sheet reach uh, protein structure. And then this process called nucleation leads to the formation of a prion seed. And from that point, everything goes really fast. Uh, the long amyloid fiber is formed. And then if the, if the fiber breaks, we one of the most uh, popular theories on how they're formed is right now focusing on uh, um, aggregating at the ends of the growing fiber. So when the fiber breaks, you get twice as many ends to interact and then it breaks again and again and that's why it becomes exponentially fast. Also this breaking can be facilitated by chaperones. So chaperones are extremely important for prion dissemination. So actually if you inhibit uh, a chaperones you are going to see that the prion uh, is no longer being transformed to transmit it to another cell because the fiber becomes too stable, it's not fragmented, so it doesn't find a way to another cell. And that's one of the way how to confirm that the protein is be behaving as a prion because it can, you can stop the transmission by influencing chaperones. And of course I had to put the former governor of California on this slide. And so because prions can be lost, but they can also be cured. And as we say, they will, after being cured, they will be back. So these are three things that characterize prions, a reversible curing. So first you have a normal form of a protein, then spontaneous transformation into prion form that happens once every million division of cell. They were talking about yeast in this case then you can use curing by influencing chaperones, for example, and they will go back to the natural uh, native form of the protein. But after one million divisions, they're going to again create a prion. So a prion is a persisting behavior of a protein. If it can form a prion, it will, and it depends on how many of the proteins is being produced. And this is the, the second example. If you have a standard 1 million division per prion, if you increase the number at expression of the protein and therefore the number of copies of a protein that can experience this behavior of forming a prion, you will get prions more often. Also, uh, you could another way to distinguish a prion is that the normal protein and the no protein uh, phenotypes are very different from each other. And when you have a prion phenotype, it looks like a deletion of the gene. So what I was showing in a few slides ago is that the prion and it's uh, the protein that forms a prion has a function, but when it aggregates, it loses its function. And the loss of function could be resemblant 
to the mutation where you deleted the gene that codes of, for this protein. So you still have the gene that makes the protein in the case of prion, but it's aggregated non-functional. So the phenotypically, it looks like you deleted the gene. Here is some nomenclature about the prion. And that's how we designate with the big letters because it's a dominant phenotype. We add plus because it's a cytoplasmic element and we have it in the brackets because they don't obey Mendel laws. And a comparison non-propagating form of a protein would be named like that in a small letter case and with a minus. So prions, in summary, behave like a heritable molecular switch, and the rate of the on and off is evolutionary balanced or tuned. And so prions could be called the transmissible aggregates that change phenotypes. And this is a very striking example where you have a non-prion form of a red pigment forming creating yeast, and then when, it, when you acquire a prion form, it turns into white. And if you look closely on the left side, some of the cells do not have the pigment because in one in a million, one in a hundred thousand generations, in this case, uh, the cells are going to acquire the prion form that is phenotypically white. And then you can just transfer it to another plate and you will grow the whole population of white cells that eventually are going to lose the prion and turn red again. Under the microscope, you can see that a non-prion form has a proteins that are soluble in the cytoplasm, and when they aggregate, they form foci that are totally visible under fluorescent microscope in yeast. So these are pretty big, stable aggregates. All right, but what is going on there? under the hood of the cell. So why do we have those red and white uh, colonies? So on the left side, you see the red pigmented yeast, and on the right side is the white pigmented yeast. The one on the left has a protein in, a, in its normal soluble form, and on the right side, it is in the aggregated amyloid forming form of the protein. The protein of, that we're talking about right now is a protein SUP35. And the SUP35 protein is a repressor of translation. It takes part in the formation of a repressor. It's part of a complex. So these little dots are the SUP35. Um, this is another protein that it binds to. And then together, they recognize the stop codons and they inhibit translation. So the ribosome going on the mRNA, it's going to stop at the stop codon because it was uh, bound to the repressor. And that's the normal situation in this case. On the other hand here, the protein SUP35 is forming an amyloid, so it's not available to form the functional repressor so the ribosome is not so efficiently recognizing stop codon, and it's actually going to make a longer protein. This is a little bit convoluted example also, because we are looking at the mutant strain of yeast that is very practical for pre and research. By on default, this gene has a premature stop codon, and this premature stop codon doesn't allow the cells to grow uh, without adenine. It's a gene that helps to produce adenine. And the, the byproduct of not being able to produce adenine is red pigment that is accumulated in a cell. So these cells on the left, very conveniently, are not going to be able to grow on adenine, but those on the right are going to be able to grow on adenine, adenine missing media. So that's a media that is uh, depleted in adenine, but it's still the cell can produce the uh, the, the whole genes, the, the proteins that are needed in adenine synthesis. So two things, color change and also ability to grow in adenine. Uh, <laughs> this is, so what is going on here after the stop codon? 
we're using this example for uh, adenine, but it could be any other gene. So if you have a situation in which a, a normally the stop cotton is recognized, what is going on on this part of the gene? There is no evolutionary pressure, and it could be anything that is being produced after that. Uh, so this actually allows evolution to speed up in these genes after the stop cotton and when the uh, prion appears or disappears, makes it available or not for record, for reading, it will it could produce any kind of a result and exploration of new forms of proteins. And the, uh, and the prions that we studied and that we scanned the whole genomes of uh, many proteins, like uh, the full proteomes of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And what we found uh, that a major majority of, pro of uh, prion forming proteins are translation terminators, are transcription repressors of multigenes, uh, they're chromatin remodeling proteins, they're RNA binding proteins. Uh, so it looks like they're work in an epigenetic, uh, so uh, over or outside around the gene uh, inheritance. So they work, they seem to be working on top of a traditional genetics because any of these, if they aggregate, they're gonna influence um, function of so many different uh, genes. If you, for example, mess up with the uh, translation terminator is in a previous slide, it's not gonna affect just one protein, it's gonna affect all of the proteins. So the phenotypic change uh, could be vast. And this is how it could be useful in evolution. You start with a cell that doesn't have a prion and lives in the environment number one, that's the green field. The environment number two is gonna be the blue field. So we go from a non-prion uh, form of, a, of yeast and at some point they do acquire, some part of them are acquiring this uh, prion phenotype. But then the environment changes. And let's imagine the situation in which the natural state is not permissive for this environment. The cells would normally die, but only the strongly changed phenotype of a prion bearing cell is able to survive and rebuild the population. And as we said, uh, they can reverse back to the non prion state, but they also had time to acquire a classical genetic mutations that could actually help them survive in the environment number two and rebuild the population. The prion is lost. They rebuild the population with the standard uh, form of a cell, but now it is already uh, evolved to be able to survive in environment number two. So prions could be evolutionary capacitors. And we call this, pro uh, this process biological bed hedging. Uh, it is a mm, term from gambling where you put your little debt on something that is very unlikely uh, to win. But if you win, you can score a lot. And that's what cells are doing. So the prions seem to be evolutionary capacitors. Uh, the non-prion state, the un untranslated region accumulate, can accumulate genetic variations in a prion state, polymorphs become phenotypically expressed. And in the prions, if the prion state lasts long, the population expands and mutates. And those mutations allow cells to maintain traits even after the prion is lost. So it seems like a little bit of inheritance of experience. So a very Lamarckian view. So the prion mechanism, they can integrate virus, diverse, diverse inputs and then they can actuate diverse outputs to provide immediate access to genetically complex traits. And so as Daniel Yarish, my supervisor at Stanford said, the controlling of the protein organization using prion-like behavior is a new paradigm in biochemical regulation at the single cell level. So yes, it also gives us a new genetic or epigenetic tool to control expression of many genes at the same time. So 
I hope that in this uh, presentation, I was able to show you that there have been a shift in the perspective on prions from rare and infectious agents to very common with multiple important functions. So how old are the prions? This is the question that I started asking at NASA. Could it be that they were present on Earth very early in the life's evolution? And so the question of how old are prions boils down to the question, how old are the amyloids? Because the amyloids is this physical form of a protein, of a prion protein anyway. So uh, if we look at that, we found amyloids in all domains of life. So pretty ancient probably it is. It also, uh, it's mostly made of beta sheet and beta sheet a uh, structure of protein is considered a very ancient structure of the protein. If we look on the ribosome, uh, the beta sheets uh, are in the um, first proteins on its outside uh, shell. Then amyloid also is seen as the lowest energy state possible. That's what this graph shows, the uh, energy landscape for protein folding where you would have an amorphous aggregate here, you would have a well-folded uh, protein on, on the left side. And as you can see, the amyloid fiber is the lowest energy that the protein can even get. And importantly, the amyloid can be formed out of very short peptides. Like in this case, this is an electron microscopy of just this peptide that is maybe nine amino acids long. But the shortest ever done uh, was just two amino acid long. So very basic structure as it seems. So in our research, we're using the bottom-up approach in which we are mixing uh, RNA coding for random uh, from random peptides, a whole library of it, and we mix it with the PureFrax that is a cell-free expression system, and we encapsulate it in liposomes to form amyloids and then to recognize them and uh, filter them out and, and go back to the sequence of the RNA and learn what kind of very simple peptides could actually form uh, amyloids. So on the other hand, the top-down approach is to look at the contemporary organisms and their DNA and search in their proteomes for proteins that are, resemble amyloid aggregates. And for that, we're using artificial intelligence, uh, um, well, um, algorithms that, that are resemble artificial intelligence. So um, and um, at the beginning of my project, when I was looking through the literature, I found mm -hmm. out that prions have so far been verified in eukaryotes and only uh, two of them were found in bacteria, but none was found in archaea. And with uh, this little number of examples, it was impossible to draw conclusions about the pheno uh, mm, uh, phylogenetic relationship of different prions. So our priority should be to find more prions to be able to assess their evolutionary origins. And my ideas caught the attention of evolutionary biologist, Lynn Rothschild, who became my supervisor at NASA. And this is how we started our hunt for prions in archaea. Uh, so at first we built this uh, phylogenetic map of uh, candidates uh, of prions, for prions in archaea. Uh, some of the species had more than 15 prion candidates per genome. Some of them had less, but in general, it was almost 3 million proteins. And out of uh, analyzed, and out of them, about 0.1% uh, were prion candidates. Then we went to the lab and an experimental verification in the test. We tested 16 proteins and eight of them formed amyloids, and uh, uh, six of them were able to carry information by recreating non-Mendelian patterns of inheritance in the East when we express them in East. So in the first experiment, I used the method in which we 
um, of the candidate protein was expressed uh, and exported outside of E. coli. Uh, the E. coli was growing on a media supplement with Congo Red, and the Congo Red is a dye that specifically binds amyloids, causing them to turn red, the colonies turn red. So it was a simple system. Um, and then the first level of our experimental screen to see if a protein is capable of forming an amyloid maybe just acquires color for now. But then we, uh, using the electron microscopy, I examined the morphology of the aggregates formed by uh, prion domains. So the fragments of the protein that are responsible for the aggregation. And uh, I noticed that eight out of 16 tested indeed formed amyloid fibers. And consequently, uh, using uh, several spectroscopic methods, we confirmed that aggregation kin kinetics is uh, typical for amyloid, this uh, short lag phase, exponential phase, and the plateau. And we also confirmed the high content of beta sheet that are very typical for amyloids. And for that, we collaborated to uh, uh, with the University of Warsaw and Robert Detz that is also on this conference. Um, in this assay, uh, six candidates were able to create prions. And so this is a yeast assay uh, where I expressed heterologically the prion candidates in yeast uh, in this uh, mutant strain that acquires colors. And we were able to create a prion uh, which was uh, trackable because it allowed cells to grow on adenine-free media and the colonies obtained a very characteristic red coloration. In conclusion, our experiments demonstrated for the first time that the proteomes uh, of archaea, um, one, you can find proteins that can form prions in archaea. And uh, we pretty much just filled out this dot. Now we know that our observation complemented the picture of prion distribution within the main branches of evolution of uh, evolutionary tree of life and suggest that there might be a continuity between uh, the first abiotic amyloids and the modern prions that act as the regulators of numerous biochemical processes. And unfortunately, sometimes they, sometimes they contribute to pathological conditions such as prion disease in humans. And, uh, and right now we're focusing on the oldest prions on earth. We already know they exist in all three domains of life. And the paper that I'm trying to submit before Christmas is uh, presenting a list of potential proteins that are potential prion proteins that are conserved across all three domains of life. It wasn't many, but we, we were able to find proteins that had uh, identical functions across all three domains of life and they all have prion domains. So very interesting candidates. So prions and the spectrum of functions that they comprise like likely represent one of the largest paradigm shifts concerning molecular encoded phenotypic diversity since identification of DNA as a principal molecule of heredity. This is a quote, it is very, <laughs> it's bold statement, but unfortunately it's not me, I can just quote someone. But yes, I think about it the same. I think it's one of the biggest shift in our understanding of, pro of inheritance of phenotypes since we discovered the DNA. And also, of course, we, I am a president of a Polish Astrobiology Society, uh, to which we are grateful for organizing this conference. And please visit our website, AstrobioPL. And with that, I would like to thank all my collaborators and friends. Uh, and uh, this is a photograph from Ames Research Center in 2018 when I first joined the team. So thank you so much. And this is the end of my presentation. I quit uh, the uh, panel uh, so I can see that unfortunately our keynote speaker is not yet present. And I think we are slowly getting to the end of the time of this session, but I hope at least I could substitute partially <laughs> the absence of, of the key speaker for today.